Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to uh, to start this short course today. Uh, it combines two different topics that are both of them very interesting. One is deep learning, of course, and the second one is um, a cloud dense computing. There are people that have uh, expertise on either of these fields, but there, there are very few people that have uh, expertise on both. So if you attend this course, uh, you will be able to do decentralized or federated learning, for example, using uh, tools that come out of um, a cloud edge computing. And uh, I would like to, I, I'm going to attend myself this course as well, because though I know many things about deep learning, I don't know many things about cloud edge computing. So it's going to be good for me as well. So I would like to thank Lorenzo Carnevale from University of Messina for volunteering to, to give the first uh, three lectures. And um, I would like also to thank the TEMA partners. Uh, TEMA is a project that is on big data analytics for natural disaster management. It organized uh, this short course and it's delivered in the framework of the International AI Doctoral Academy. Uh, so now, Lorenzo, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I say thank you, Professor Pidas, and again, good morning to, to everybody. Uh, I'm assistant professor at the University of Messina, and my research activity is at the cross of uh, cloud, edge computing, and artificial intelligence. This is why, I mean, Professor Peter mentioned also the, um, the application of federated learning, which is one of the most important at the cross of the two fields right now. So the, the free courses are about uh, cloud, and edge computing in general, so a really brief introduction. Uh, I will try to don't be so long, so I will try to adapt the lecture according to the time we have. Then I prepared something about microservices, so containers and other containers, specifically the technology that uh, enables us to, um, to work with containers. I have also some, uh, uh, some slides with some and so on. I don't think we will have time to do something command line, but they will be in the afternoon there. Um, uh, the, the practical session where a part of this will be, will be shown. And then the same thing for, for, uh, for Kubernetes, which is the orchestrator of containers. Let me now share the screen. So I will share my entire screen. Okay, may you see the screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, I'm going to screen. Okay. Connect to your smartphone. Okay. Um, well, let's start by discussing about cloud computing and mostly why cloud computing. I mean, um, if I understood well, I mean, the community to which I'm discussing is probably more um, used to discuss about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Um, as you know, I mean, uh, the, the, the trend that we have now is the trend of large language models. And this kind of trend is here since, uh, since years. I mean, large language models were, were not, I mean, uh, created two years ago by OpenAI. But OpenAI, I mean, uh, had really the, the smart idea to put this kind of models and then the artificial intelligence on a cloud platform. In this way, they created ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is just a um, uh, software as a service platform. We will see what these terms means that enabled the, the, everybody around the world to access this kind of knowledge and intelligence. And this become really pervasive. I mean, I don't know in, uh, in, in other country, but in Italy, I mean, at the beginning, deep learning was discussed in radio. Uh, so really in a mainstream, uh, um, um, mainstream channel, and it was really surprising to me. But really, the great advantage that uh, OpenAI got from uh, the creation of the model was putting the model into uh, something like the cloud computing. 
But we now, I mean, uh, discussing about cloud, uh, and then we will see what the edge compounding is and what is the relation with the uh, So cloud compounding, of course, is uh, um, a terms uh, with which we specify services and development of services uh, over the internet. Um, services are hosted in uh, uh, remote infrastructure in uh, um, uh, computers or, best, or better data centers that are geographically dislocated all around the world. The services become ubiquitous. We can access them from uh, anywhere and with any device. We can access it from, uh, um, uh, from the computer here in a desktop uh, station, or we, or we can access them from the smartphone. I created the slides and uh, my colleagues uh, helped me to create the slides using a cloud platform, the platform provided by, by Microsoft, no? the Office uh, uh, 365. Um, the result at the end is like um, about commodity, like, I mean, uh, utility is called the uh, uh, computing model, uh, which is like the utilities we have every day at home, like the gas, like the electricity. And the great, the great model that was behind is that we just pay for what we consume, for what we need, like we do, I mean, with the gas and with the electricity. Um, cloud computing, I mean, um, is, of course, a complex uh, platform, uh, which anyway um, um, makes transparent the underlying uh, infrastructure to users and to applications by using uh, some uh, uh, user interface or some API, so the application programming interface. Um, then this platform, as I said, is provided on demand, uh, anywhere, anytime, from any place, and uh, um, uh, the other and the software services are available for enterprises, general public, corporation, business markets, and so on. Um, this is a kind of uh, uh, general uh, uh, infrastructure of uh, um, uh, cloud computing where there, are, where there is a shared pool of computing resources. When I talk about computing resources, I have to mention CPUs, uh, memory, RAM, disk, so storage, databases, um, networking. And, uh, all of them are um, uh, on demand used by, by the user. The user doesn't task really for resources, but just asks for some service. And the cloud company behind uh, tries to um, better uh, assign the needed resources according to the, uh, the ones uh, required by that service. And that's why, I mean, uh, we have some kind of service provider that tries to broker this kind of, uh, of approach. Um, I mean, cloud has uh, uh, specific characteristics like uh, flexibility and elasticity. Because, I mean, the resources can grow, can be elastically um, um, grow um, when they are needed. Um, resources that, again, could be about CPU. So that means if our application needs one or two cores of a CPU, this will uh, elastically assign to these resources, to these services, um, one or more of these CPUs. The same for the storage. So if our application is using one gigabyte uh, um, of storage for a computation, but after some, uh, then the computation will require for more space, this will elastically be assigned to this, uh, to this service. So uh, at the end of the day, um, the user and then um, I mean, who uses this kind of services pay just for what they use. And that means uh, the resources are always on, uh, anywhere and any place. J just the user asks for the uh, utilization of uh, such resources. So the cloud is uh, uh, transparent and can be built in uh, multiple ways. So there are, of course, different big players in the field of uh, um, cloud computing, but also means small players that try to provide um, uh, cloud computing facilities. So that means uh, these uh, uh, providers could be um, uh, proprietary of hardware or software. The software could be open source or not. Um, the products could be branded or not. 
Um, and in general, I mean, they are built like a cluster of, uh, um, of personal computer servers or just, I mean, uh, data centers that are dislocated all around the world in a, um, uh, let's say, anyway, complex, uh, complex infrastructure. These are the layers of uh, cloud computing that uh, uh, more than 20 years ago now uh, were theorized and uh, on which, I mean, the cloud computing is built. Uh, from the bottom, we have the infrastructure as a service, uh, which is most related with the engineer, uh, network, architects, uh, um, uh, who builds really, who installs the hardware, no? the, the bare metals. Uh, then we have the platform as a service. We will see them in details in a, in a while, but just to have a brief overview. The platform as a service is uh, the layer of the cloud computing dedicated to applications uh, um, uh, and, and development. And then we have the software as a service, where we have really the end users. And some examples that probably we use almost all of us every day is the, um, um, the email client like Gmail or Microsoft. Um, I mean, these are um, um, described like this. I mean, uh, we can say, we can see that in the software as a service provider application that uh, um, um, provider only provides software as a service while the cloud infrastructure is provided by another provider, which is the provider of the cloud infrastructure. And we will see, I mean, what um, is in the management of this kind of providers for each of the layers. So for instance, an infrastructure as a service provider only provides infrastructure as a service, so really the, uh, the hardware. Um, the infrastructure as a service then is uh, uh, the delivery of really a uh, technology infrastructure and uh, the, the provider of the infrastructure as a service manages the scalability of, uh, of the system. Um, in, Usually, the utilization of this infrastructure is built on the usage, and uh, uh, the software over this uh, infrastructure is uh, uh, virtualized. So it's built over a virtualization layer. Uh, you, with the virtualization layer, we can logically create multiple computers inside one single computer, which is really a, um, um, a winning approach because we created the isolated uh, logic machines inside one single machine that from the security point of view, but also from the utilization point of view, is, uh, um, um, is quite strong. Right? So that's why, I mean, they uh, provide a pool of uh, virtual machines that are connected in, uh, um, uh, in internet, in a private or in a public internet, and then they have the virtual network devices. Um, so the virtualization, as I said, was the, uh, the winning approach for uh, the infrastructure as a service, because then we have a layer of abstraction of the underlying infrastructure. With the classic uh, uh, virtualization, which is different uh, compared with the containers, we will see them later. In the classic virtualization approach, we virtualize an entire stack of technology and we virtualize also the hardware. So the hardware is like recreated from the software point of view, and the um, um, user of that virtual machine doesn't have any idea to be inside a virtual machine. For the user of that uh, uh, virtual machine, this is the entire computer. So it's an abstraction of the physical host machine that is, uh, uh, that is underlying. Um, um, there is a specific piece of software, which is called a hypervisor, the hypervisor intercepts and emulates the instruction from the virtual machine uh, to the operating system, which is underlined. The virtual machine is typically called a guest because it's a guest inside the operating system. And the operating system that runs virtual machine is called a host. There are multiple uh, hypervisors, the most famous and uh, uh, not open source, so the commercial one and uh, VMware, uh, um, uh, for instance, there is also Xen, Xen has also some open source uh, um, uh, solution, and then we have also uh, VirtualBox, which is one of the most common users also for education. Um, the hypervisor, of course, provides uh, infrastructure APIs. 
um, um, VirtualBox, for instance, has a user interface that facilitates the, the running of uh, a virtual machine and the management of a virtual machine, but there is also a command line. So it's possible to, to use and to manage virtual machine in a, a headless approach. Um, infrastructure as a service uh, took also different names because there is any way the trend to have like a X AAS, so like a job, you know, with the X we can put any kind of name, because at the end we can have a computing as a service, the storage as a service, database as a service. So the concept of as a service becomes a building model in cloud computing, and what uh, the uh, cloud provider provides depends just on uh, uh, what uh, the, the, they want to do for the business. Uh, examples of infrastructure as a service, of course, are provided by, by Amazon, by the results of Azure, or uh, uh, Google, um, uh, Google Cloud Platform, which is also the unique one that provides the tensor process units of the, the um, uh, Other players are XSpace, uh, um, uh, OpenStack, I mean, all these uh, um, uh, providers who are really uh, really great, mostly at the beginning of uh, the cloud era, it was more or less in 2008. Um, and then, of course, the big players uh, took the stage, and then I, they are kind of monopolizing the, the entire uh, The platform as a service uh, provides uh, instead uh, facilities to support the life cycle of building and delivering applications. This is mostly a tool used by developers. So the developer has a, um, um, a set of tools that helps him to build new applications. Let's image a Visual Studio Code provided on, uh, uh, on a cloud platform, for instance. So the compiler is there, the interpreter of Python could be there, the libraries could be there, the bugger could be there, and then just the um, um, and of course, also the underlying infrastructure. And so that means that uh, the developer can just use these applications over a browser. Google Colab, just to make an example I mean, concrete that maybe uh, you use uh, um, uh, during your work activity, is a platform as a service. There, are, there is behind uh, a set of libraries, the typical is a Jupyter like uh, set, so uh, Pandas, NumPy. Uh, TensorFlow PyTorch, they are the variable, you don't need to install them. In, behind there is also an um, infrastructure which is really, uh, really powerful, but this is provided for free. If there is the need to have, for instance, a, a GPU for the training, uh, uh, Google uh, in, uh, in the Colab notebook asks for some money. And then this is the pay per use model. So we use the GPU for, for instance, one hour of training, uh, and then we pay just for this one hour. Even for the platform as a service, this could be a multi-tenant environment. So uh, there are multiple uh, domains and users that can uh, access the, the infrastructure. And the infrastructure is uh, highly scalable um, according to a multi tier And finally, the model is completed with the software as a service which is a, really a software deployment model where the application is hosted as a service and this is just used. Typically, the user cannot modify the application, but only some, some setting. Let's imagine, I mean, the Google Gmail. We can just access the, um, um, the software, so we can access the, um, uh, our email client. And we can just tune some, uh, some parameters in, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the settings. So we can change our signature, we can create folders, but we cannot modify the application. Um, of course, the software as a service behind has some uh, infrastructure as a service provided by the software as a service provided, uh, where, I mean, this software is, uh, is run. Um, software as a service is different uh, um, it's not a web application because a web application is something that uh, um, doesn't have behind a highly scalable approach, doesn't have the logic of elasticity, doesn't have the logic of on-demand um, um, on services. Okay, so 
software as a service is something that uh, is not completely different because anyway there is a web application behind but there is also the logic of um, uh, some scalable approach and mostly is also provided to be um, in a multi-tenant uh, multi um, fashion of course i mean the cloud computing has different uh, um, different benefits and also disadvantages uh, cloud computing enabled companies and applications, I mean, to be independent from the infrastructure. Um, before of the cloud computing, any uh, organization or enterprise had to buy the permits, had to buy the, the server, install them in some place in uh, um, uh, the office. That means adding also a, a good air conditioner um, uh, system because the data center um, uh, generates, I mean, the, the it's warm, it needs to be refrigerated. Uh, then the data center needed to be maintained. So with the cloud computing, all of this uh, is going in outsourcing. So there is a cloud provider that provides this hardware on the market. Um, the only thing that uh, uh, the clients at that point need is a, a desktop PC, a laptop, I mean, just a device with a good internet connection to access the cloud, uh, the cloud facility application then move on the cloud and uh, that means that uh, they can just process and manipulate uh, data um, uh, for instance inside the, the cloud platform consider also that if during the time the uh, data center needed to be uh, extended with uh, multiple um, uh, with um, different resources they needed to be by the installed the data center now we have just to rent with the paper use model directly from the cloud provider. So the consumer typically signs a contract to use the, the service. This is something we do also with Gmail, for instance, when we create the Google account. It's in the um, uh, agreement that we typically skip, but is uh, is there inside? So the consumer pays then for uh, what is uh, um, what is used. Uh, there are, of course, facilities that are provided for free, like again, Gmail. Even if, I mean, we accept that Google uses our data, uh, like, uh, like payment. Um, and then, I mean, a bill is provided uh, after, I mean, the end of the cycle, that could be the end of the processment or, I mean, on a monthly basis. Um, so, cloud computing provided uh, several opportunities, like, uh, um, um, using an economy of scale, uh, the cost is uh, um, um, calculated on demand. Vendor as service providers claims the cost by establishing an ongoing revenue stream. Uh, data services are stored remotely and accessible by anywhere. Let's think about Dropbox, iCloud, the Google Drive. I mean, we store our data there inside and then from uh, uh, every, any, anywhere with any device, we can just access them. Um, the computing cost is, uh, is lower uh, thanks to the cloud computing. We don't really need a high powered or high priced computer to run a, a cloud computing web application. I mean, like, our smartphones since the beginning were able to run, um, uh, to run software as a service. Um, what we just need, I mean, is to have a, a good, um, a good internet connection in order to um, to use such application. Um, so the point is that we can also buy, I mean, a client which is not so powerful. We don't need any CD. We don't need any DVD drive. And also the evolution of our hardware, so our laptop today doesn't have any more DVD drive. Just because I mean, cloud I mean, changed completely the, the approach also on, uh, on the um, We improve also the performance at that point um, because I mean, we can uh, we can use uh, these resources elastically uh, that are remotely located. Also, the cost of the software uh, is is reduced. Before we had to uh, to buy uh, like. Uh, um, desktop application and to install in our 
um, um, in our system, in our operating system. Today, instead, we have uh, um, free or um, um, I mean, softwares that are under the payment of a fee, like uh, the Google Docs, uh, Google Docs Suite. Um, that was really also a different change of paradigm in this approach. So or, uh, typically, uh, if we want to use them for free, I mean, Google provides them in a way to, to have a word processor or a, a calculated processor like, uh, like Excel. Um, the software updates it was another great advantage. We are never aware that there is an update. Really. Gmail updates, I mean, on a regular basis. But we don't see an update. We don't have. We don't live. I mean, we don't live a um, discontinuity of the um, of the service. Uh, different is uh, if we have to maintain our data center and then we have to update, for instance, the underlying operating system. The data server needs to be switched off. Otherwise, we cannot really really do it. So we need to uh, migrate all the data on another computer. Then uh, uh, doing uh, um, the, the update of the software and then probably uh, bringing back uh, data where in, in the original place. This is something that is already done, is anyway done by the cloud computing provider. But given that they have uh, many, many facilities, many, many hardware available, I mean, this is quite transparent to us and it happens in a way where we don't have any, any disconnect. Um, also, I mean, the uh, possibilities to have uh, uh, document format uh, compatibility. It seems, I mean, uh, uh, not so important, but if you remember, I mean, we had at the beginning some issue uh, using, for instance, a word processor in Mac or in a Windows system. They were not compatible. But, I mean, with this approach where uh, the files are accessible from anywhere and from any device, uh, this, I mean, pushed a lot the, uh, I mean, the uh, software creators on making compatibilities between the uh, different processes. The document so can be universally accessed. We can also share this document uh, between our colleagues, or um, um, I mean, we can also try to have an history of the document. We can then retrieve a previous, uh, um, um, a previous version of that document because we see that we made an error, so we want to get back. Um, and uh, the latest version of the uh, softwares provided by a cloud computing provider are always available. So the cloud computing always hosts the latest version of, uh, of the document. So as long as, uh, as, long as I'm connected, um, I mean, I can have uh, um, the, the last version of my, of my document. Storage capacity could be, I mean, ideally unlimited. Because, I mean, cloud computing offers uh, uh, virtually uh, limitless storage. Of course, I mean, we pay for even more, but there are already providers like Google Drive that provides 15 uh, gigabytes uh, for free. But just with the 20 euros per year, I mean, just to make an example, this is extended to 100 or 200 gigabytes, I remember. I mean, in our university, for instance, we have an agreement with Microsoft Azure and per person, so per each account, we have something like five terabytes. Okay, so this is really a, a huge amount of space uh, for a single uh, a single person. I mean, um, and it, if we think that uh, it, it was quite impossible today to have a um, um, a disk of five terabytes in our laptop, just because it makes things really expensive. So our computer with a five terabyte disk could be really, really expensive. Um, I mean, cloud computing provided us I mean, the possibility to have a capacity which is ideally, ideally. Um, again, the reliability. One of the uh, most important aspects of cloud computing is that uh, uh, services uh, needs to be always available and reliable. So unlike desktop computing, where I mean, an application can crash because I mean their disk could uh, could be discontinued, could be destroyed for some reason. We could have some corrupted data. I mean, this is something that typically cloud computing doesn't happen. Also, because I mean there is a constant backup of uh, of data, and if an issue is encountered, 
um, method computing is quite method computing provider uh, is quite able to elastically move to a different version of the same application and then uh, restabling the uh, correct functionality of the, of the system. Um, again, I mean, I already mentioned it, so it's possible to easily uh, collaborate with a group of people. Um, uh, we can share a document, we can put this document in a folder and the folder is shared with the, um, a group of people. Um, it's independent of the device, so I can access the document from a smartphone. Of course, it's not so convenient to write down um, a Word document with a smartphone, but we can do it. Or I can do it with my um, desktop system. Um, so a change that I made, of course, from my computer, this is immediately visible to everybody. And I mean, a good um, uh, software as a service uh, uh, system enables also to collaborate at the same time in the same document. So that means two uh, or more people can write on the same Word document, for instance, at the same time. And we are able to see, I mean, the modification uh, the modification in real time. Uh, I mean, this conceptually seems easy, but think about, I mean, the um, version control of a source code where we have also conflict, you know? And sometimes, I mean, it happens that we commit a, um, we commit a, a new piece of software, you know, a snippet, and then um, we see that there is a conflict because in the same lines, uh, some, other, uh, some other developer um, uh, wrote some line, and then the system doesn't know how to resolve the conflict. It's more or less the same approach, but I mean, cloud computing is able to do it uh, immediately and uh, um, in an easy way, and this is really transparent, uh, transparent for us. Of course, I mean, there are disadvantages. I mean, it's not that cloud computing is the panacea of everything. Uh, the, the most important thing is that we need to be connected. And cloud computing is, of course, over internet. So we need a constant internet connection to use a cloud computing service. Um, not only I mean a constant internet connection, but let me say also a good internet connection. Because according to the kind of service that we want to use, we need a low speed connection or a high speed connection. Let me make an example. If I have just to read the emails, uh, um, I mean, the client, I mean, the browser, for instance, with which I use Gmail or Microsoft Outlook, is just downloading, uh, is just loading text, probably some image, if there is a, an attachment in, uh, um, in the email, so image or some document. Of course, this is, doesn't require, I mean, uh, a massive uh, download, downloading of, uh, of the but Netflix is a cloud provider. Um, it's a software as a service, like uh, Disney Plus, Amazon, uh, um, Amazon Prime. They provide a streaming service. Spotify provides a streaming service. Different streaming, one is just video, the other one is, uh, is music. Of course, providing a video streaming service, mostly when this is provided in 4K, uh, it needs a good, um, a good connection, okay? Otherwise, I mean, we cannot guarantee to have the 4K uh, visualization of, uh, uh, of this thing. So the bandwidth is really important. And that's why also, uh, even, I mean, uh, I mean, in all the cities, we are changing now the network infrastructure and we have uh, the uh, optical fiber more or less, more or less everywhere. So the cloud, I mean, dream also this kind of change uh, in our cities. Um, I mean, features may be limited. Features may be limited because, uh, uh, I mean, the cloud provider has different uh, uh, service model in terms of, uh, in terms of business. Um, um, I mean, uh, typically we have some uh, uh, free resources that we use um, um, without any kind of, uh, of build approach, but if we want, Extended, uh, um, extended features and functionalities we pay for, um, uh, for this. Again, the same example I did before. We had uh, 15 gigabytes of space for Google Drive, but if we want more, we have to pay. 
we have a Google Doc Suite with, uh, of course, more or less all the features that needs to uh, um, a common user. But if we want some uh, advanced features that are present in, uh, for instance, Microsoft Office, we need to pay. And then we need to, uh, to unlock this kind of features. Um, so the Microsoft uh, um, Office uh, uh, 365 free version is not the same, of course, of the Microsoft Office 365 um, um, version, uh, premium version, where we pay, where we pay. Cloud computing can be slow, okay? Because, I mean, even with a fast connection, um, web-based application can send time and be, be slower to be accessed by uh, our desktop PC. Um, so everything, I mean, about uh, the, the program like interface, the, the documents sent back, I mean, and forth uh, data from the computer that we use to the computers in the cloud. So we have a constant, I mean, exchanging of, uh, of data and information, uh, like we are doing now. I mean, we are using a, a cloud service like, uh, like Zoom. I'm sending, I mean, my audio and video streaming. You are downloading, you are running video streaming. Right now, our um, exchange of data is, uh, is going up. Um, and sometimes could be that if for some reason the connection is not, I mean, good in that moment, uh, the service is not discontinued. The service is that delayed. Could be that you see the voice, you hear the voice delayed. Could be that you um, uh, you see the image of my of my camera uh, like stuck, or that you don't see the, the screen that can be shown. Um, then the other issue that uh, typically uh, I mean scared everybody is about security. Data, of course, uh, could not be secure, but in terms of what? In terms of the fact that uh, um, data are typically stored, we don't know where. Data are not stored mandatorily in Europe, typically. I mean, not at the beginning, at least. Now, Europe is trying to uh, regulate this. But, I mean, Amazon is a uh, USA provider, for instance, and most of the data centers, of course, are in USA. So typically, when we use a, um, Amazon uh, Amazon service, could be that we move the traffic to, to USA. Of course, I mean, today we have the GDPR, mostly after the Cambridge Analytica issue that we experienced with the, in the USA election some, uh, some year ago. And with the GDPR, the idea is that GDPR is a European regulation. Uh, the point is that, I mean, data needs to stay in Europe, so where they are, uh, where they are created. That's why the big player mostly, so Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, they are building um, uh, data centers, uh, entire data center, or just cash data center in, uh, uh, in our countries. Um, one of the most uh, important region of, uh, I mean, near to, to Italy, for instance, is the Frankfurt one. So in Frankfurt, there is uh, one of the uh, bigger region of uh, Amazon AWS. In Just to make another example, in Italy, then in Milan, Amazon built a cache uh, data center, where we just, I mean, where they just cache the network of the entire country of Italy. So that means uh, the request will go first to the cache data center. If there are no data there, then it will go to the front. Um, stored I mean, data could be lost. This is something that uh, with a good provider, I mean, uh, almost never happens, but um, it's a risk. I mean, data are not in our own. We don't have data really in our disk. So could be that there is some physical error in uh, the data centers providers, cloud providers, and then we could risk to lose the data. I mean, it's not a secret that sometimes, I mean, there were also um, uh, unprevented access of, uh, of data that uh, um, uh, were I mean, stolen and uh, were used to, um, to be solved. For instance, the 
um, uh, the credentials of the bank account. Okay? It sometimes happened, unfortunately. And that's why, I mean, security is one of the main issues behind the, the, the cloud. Um, cloud computing then means uh, depending on others, means depending on the cloud. Okay? Uh, so if we build a business using a, a cloud provider like Google, IBM, Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft, without the help of that companies, we cannot have our business. So we have to accept that uh, we depend on uh, other technologies. Um, security, of course, it's a, a big issue to be, to be maintained. And also, I mean, um, um, access policy is a big issue to be maintained. And this is typically something that we deal with when, uh, um, I mean, the cloud provider I mean, sells the, um, the services solution. Um, we have different deployment models. Uh, cloud could be public, uh, off-site and remote. It describes uh, cloud company where resources are dynamically provided on demand with self-service bases over the internet. Um, could be that there are 30 parties providers who builds for utility computing bases. Uh, and typically, I mean, um, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are um, a provider of the public cloud. Cloud could be also provided in a private environment. So it's first, the first step of a, uh, a corporation prior, no? uh, prior to uh, adapt a public cloud needs. Because in a private cloud, I mean, the organization manages the entire, the entire infrastructure. Um, that's why, I mean, they discovered, I mean, the advantage of virtualization. So virtualizing hardware and then uh, serve users uh, um, uh, remotely. Cloud could be also hybrid. So that means uh, it's done, uh, part of the resources are on-site. This is typically called on-premise in, uh, in an enterprise environment or off-site, so public cloud. So it takes the advantage of, uh, of both. And this is typically what, I mean, uh, companies prefer to, to adapt because they can maintain some business logic in a private environment and then, I mean, providing other facilities. On a the other important topic could be Cloud Federation. Cloud Federation means that multiple organizations or several organizations with similar requirements and uh, infrastructure decide to uh, be part of a big cluster. So they are part of a larger cloud where each, anyway, um, organization is the uh, proprietary of that uh, resources and infrastructure. So it's like a model to share resources and saying that uh, I'm managing like a, a cloud uh, solution in, um, in Messina, just to make an example. But then, I mean, my resources are not enough to serve, I mean, the amount of requests that I'm receiving, and then I use, because I have this uh, agreement of federation, the resources of uh, another organization. So that means the services is not running in my cloud, but is running in the cloud of the other organization, but logically, this is still uh, one single cloud for, for the day. Um, okay. Let me now switch to um, something different. Let me discuss about uh, the evolution of, uh, of cloud computing, because today, really, cloud computing is often associated with uh, different uh, different terms. With different terms. Okay, one of these terms is, uh, is fog computing, the other one is uh, edge computing. Let's understand, I mean, the difference between uh, cloud, fog, and edge. And today we have also the model of the uh, cloud to edge computing, which is also called the computing continuum, where I mean we try to put the continuity of computation between the cloud resource, the fog resource, and the 
had to use this. Um, so the fog resource was typically uh, built because uh, um, there was the need to move the computation needed to uh, the data source. That's why, I mean, the, the trend of, uh, um, I mean, um, of cloud was to move all the data that were generated over the cloud in order to be processed. This, I mean, built also the, 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 um, the technology that today is now like today. So we have, I mean, a really huge amount of data that are created from our devices. We typically wear also the devices like smartphones, we have smart glasses, we have smart watches. Uh, all of them, I mean, generates data. A smartphone generates data from the social networks, generate data from the applications that we use, generate data from, uh, I mean, the, um, uh, the browsing of, uh, uh, of the, the surfing of the internet. All these data are typically, in the traditional approach, sent over the cloud. Inside the cloud, there is the storage as a service where we, uh, of course, store the data. But there is also, I mean, the computation as a service where we compute with our uh, models, algorithms, anyway, general application, I mean, and we process the data in order to provide the service to the client. One of the most common uh, applications in that sense is uh, analytics. So analytics of data that are created from a statistical point of view, but then later also from a machine learning point of view, it's something that was uh, um, like an outcome of big data and cloud computing. What is the issue? The issue is that, uh, I mean, uh, we are really generating uh, too much data now. <laughs> the network infrastructure is, uh, um, I mean, uh, is congestioning quite fastly. Um, so that means uh, we, um, we, I mean, the, the migration of this data to the cloud is becoming a bottleneck for our network infrastructure. Sometimes data are also quite big, because when we um, just uh, uh, film a video uh, or children just, for example, and then we want uh, store them in a cloud, uh, this, I mean, according to the quality of the camera, could be some, some megabytes, sometimes could be some gigabytes. Um, so the cloud computing model needed a, um, a restyling. So that's why we in the, um, the solution, the cloud computing solution, try to, uh, to move next to the, the data source. And the other reason is that, uh, um, I mean, some application uh, needs to have a, um, a reply from the, the service and the computation, which is done in, in real time or real time. This is something that with the cloud computing cannot be done. Because of course, there is again a network in the middle. So there is a latency that needs to be considered. A latency, so is the, the amount of time from which we make the request from the client and we get the response from the server. Considering the fact that the cloud has also to compute that, uh, um, the, to make some process on the data. So some kind of application like, I mean, uh, um, uh, inference on uh, uh, of, uh, of models in the cloud cannot be done in uh, something like near real time. Uh, this is then a second reason why um, the cloud computing paradigm try to move into uh, next to the data source. And still, I mean, the reason why uh, this was possible is because the devices that generate data Today are not anyway, let me say, stupid anymore. They are not, I mean, so, um, uh, I mean, um, they don't lack resources. I mean, a, a smartphone today is quite able to, uh, to make a good processment. Other kind of devices are used like edge devices. I mean, let me mention, for instance, the Raspberry. Let me mention the, um, the Jetson uh, uh, series of NVIDIA. There are, I mean, devices like the Jet Sonorin that provides a quite good um, computation environment, and this is an edge device. Of course, I mean, there are different costs from a Raspberry to a Jet Sonorin, 
but these are the rises i mean that could be considered like small clouds next to the uh, source fog was built to um fog was built to uh, manage i mean the uh, proximity in terms mostly of uh, network there was the need to um, to facilitate the introduction of uh, uh, new technologies like the, the Internet of Things and the creation of these uh, connected devices, and then FOG uh, uh, enabled, I mean, the, uh, a smart um, connection between the Internet of Things and, uh, um, um, and the cloud company. Typically, I mean, uh, um, networking today in, is quite smart as well. There are software defined networks. So the different network are virtual networks that are created on a network infrastructure. These are still piece of software. The software can be managed by um, still by a cloud provider. Software can be created, I mean, elastically um, and still on demand. So you have a pool of uh, Internet of Things. They are part of my network. Then uh, a virtual network is created and. Uh, this is a reason why uh, we can maintain a good level of security or we can maintain a good level of uh, um, quality of service. So that network could reduce the latency, uh, could manage the, uh, the pooling of, uh, of resources. The goal at the end is giving a, uh, to the user an experience which is a good experience, you know, an experience where uh, the application can fail. Um, I mean, examples uh, that I mean, uh, took advantage from the phone computing, of course, are phones, wearable devices for health monitoring, for instance, connected vehicles, augmented realities, and so on. Um, the FOG architecture, I mean, includes security, scalability, uh, programmability, the rust, reliability, availability, and serviceability. Um, hierarchy, agility, and so on. The other approach is uh, the edge computing. Edge computing, uh, um, I mean, pushes really the application inside the devices that generate data. Uh, edge computing tries to uh, replicate fragments of information, I mean, across distributed networks or web services, and tries to replicate like a small cloud facility inside this kind of uh, devices. Um, typically, um, uh, edge computing, I mean, uses peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer, uh, um, peer -peer models or mesh, uh, mesh network models. Uh, edge computing introduces a level of self-healing, so autonomic computing. So, um, um, the approach is to uh, try avoiding something which is centralized so that not always is uh, um, um, I mean, is, uh, is available so edge computing could be a, a good uh, uh, campaign of the cloud computing and sometimes also a replacement in environment where uh, internet connection could be that is not always available like in, uh, I mean, extreme zone, let's think about, uh, let's make an example, the North Pole, or, I mean, uh, some uh, uh, scenario with uh, natural disasters, internet connection could be not available. So that means uh, even if we generate data, because we have sensors in the North Pole, we have sensors in the environment that experienced a natural disaster, we cannot move this data to the cloud if the connection is broken. It could be that with an earthquake, the uh, network infrastructure could drop. Okay? Um, so that's why deploying a uh, edge computing, uh, I mean, near to that areas, could replace, in this case, the, um, um, the utilization of the cloud. So the computation could be made inside these devices, so called edge devices. Edge devices are, of course, typically really small compared to the cloud. I mean, a Raspberry, of course, can never be compared with a full data center with uh, GPUs and so on. 
That's why typically edge computing needs to be clusters, needs to have multiple um, edge devices uh, that can, I mean, share the resources, can anyway uh, make a kind of cloud model next to, um, uh, next to the, uh, the, the source. Um, edge computing today are, uh, is a model that is going also uh, with the same business model of cloud. Uh, so uh, it's going to be provided as well using the, the pay per use mode. Um, and of course, there are anyway certain limitations that uh, we have to consider because not all the um, applications could run inside an edge environment. Still, let's thinking about a pool of smartphones, a pool of raspberries, or also Jetson Nano. If we have this kind of devices, we cannot train a large language models. Okay, it needs too much, um, too much memory mm -hmm. space. It needs too much time. Um, uh, it needs too much time in terms of uh, in terms of computation. That still, I mean. Uh, it's not possible to have a successful training in this kind of devices, at least not with the traditional approach that we use today. Of course, I mean, the research is going ahead, trying to, uh, to resolve also this issue. That's why edge computing is here to, to work, I mean, like a standalone application, but mostly this is a, um, a companion of, uh, of the cloud. Um, and in order to be a good companion, uh, this is why, I mean, we today uh, try to talk about uh, computing continuum. What do I mean now with computing continuum? As we say, the, the computation could be done on the edge, but could be done also in the cloud. We can make like a policy saying that uh, before we try to compute on the edge. Computing on the edge has the advantage, as I say, to maintain um, lower the, the latency to maintain, I mean, lower the congestion of the network. And something that I didn't mention, if I don't need to send the data from the data source to the cloud, I still maintain my data uh, privacy uh, with, a good, uh, with a good quality of service. You know? Because if my data are sensible and I send it to the cloud, of course, this could be a risk. The risk could be in the... Um, uh, the migration of the data, in the storage of the data, in the usage of the data. But if data never leave, I mean, the location where they were created, I mean, the privacy is maintained. So we could have like a policy saying, okay, let's start making the computation there over the edge. At the edge, as we say, it is limited. So that means uh, we try to have a uh, scalability inside these devices, but they have limited resources. That's why we could say, okay, we cannot continue the computation on the edge. We need the help of the cloud resources. And that means we make something that is called offloading, offloading of the, of the, of the computation. So that means we migrate the um, computation from the edge directly to the cloud. Of course, in this case, we have to move not only the computation, but also the data where we compute, uh, on which we, we make the the processing. I mean, it's something that anyway we have to do if we want to uh, have a result for that problem. Otherwise, I mean, we cannot complete the, uh, the process. Um, okay, I mean, uh, edge computing then was, uh, uh, it's quite, I mean, uh, uh, disrupting right now in the, uh, in the cloud model. So um, really, um, conferences, but uh, researchers, academia are really moving to, um, to edge computing because it's the new trend today for, for the computation. Um, and I mean, uh, also artificial intelligence is trying to move on, uh, on edge devices. Um, Alexa today, for instance, doesn't do um, an edge computation because it uses, uh, um, it uses the cloud. To, uh, to make the inference of our, uh, and to make the speech recognition and so on. Uh, but I mean, there is some complaint mostly about this device, but in the future we could have some Alexa-like device where the model uh, will be installed for the inference, I mean, 
installed inside the, this edge device. It means this device, which is a virtual assistant, could be disconnected by internet, okay? And be, I mean, able to serve, I mean, the user, even if with, of course, limited capacities, if we are disconnected, of course, with the you no know, taxes, uh, I mean, all the resources and uh, uh, knowledge which is available online, but we can still maintain this kind of, uh, of service. So mostly for privacy, for latency, network congestion, I mean, we are trying to move the computation next to the users, so next to the, uh, the resource. Um, how, I mean, was possible to have this kind of flexibility? This is, I mean, like just a overview of microservices, and then I will mention more um, during I mean, the, um, the other model that uh, will start in a while. Um, uh, we do it with the microservice architect, which is, I mean, in uh, contraposition with the, the monolithic one. So the beginning applications were built like uh, um, uh, huge applications, where, I mean, um, um, uh, even if there were different uh, uh, pieces of software that could be just, um, um, I mean, uh, uh, not, uh, uh, I mean, decoupled between each other, uh, the application was just one. And this is the example of the desktop application. So if we have just to update one line of code inside a desktop application, we have to re-update the entire desktop application. Microservices try to split, I mean, where is possible, the application in multiple uh, applications, okay? That at the end, uh, they um, compete, let's say they collaborate to have one single solution. Uh, but this is much more flexible. Um, each microservice is much smaller than the, the, the monolith. If we have to update uh, a piece of software which is inside one microservice, we can still maintain the, um, the other microservice active and available for the users. Let's make an example. And, uh, uh, an e-commerce website has multiple uh, microservices where each service could be dedicated for the catalog is a microservice. One could be dedicated only for the review is another microservice. One could be dedicated for uh, the storage is another microservice. So each of them is, uh, they have different features. They can evolve differently within each other. Different team can work on these microservices without, I mean, interfering with the other. And still, if we need to migrate this microservice from one machine, so from one virtual machine to the other virtual machine, we do it in, uh, in, uh, in a while, because this microservice is quite, is quite small in terms of size, and then, I mean, we, um, we can migrate in another location. Or again, if the microservice is in the edge, and then we want to migrate in the cloud, with the microservice, we can do it. With the monolite, we can do it. Um, okay, I mean, uh, cloud computing, I already mentioned this kind of technologies, but uh, after the cloud computing, I mean, many technologies took advantage. In 2014, uh, Internet of Things took advantage of this because there was the need to disseminate uh, uh, internet-connected devices uh, all around the world, um, also mean to monitor ourselves with, for instance, some smartwatch. But then we need to, to collect this data. I mean, the cloud was the model that helped us to, um, uh, I mean, to collect the data and then to visualize, I mean, the analytics behind this data. Um, then, I mean, the data itself, I mean, the insight of the data itself, that was a big trend mostly for digital marketing. So data were generated, I mean, in a vast amount. So the, all the big data challenges uh, were born over, over the cloud company. The velocity of the creation of data, the vastity of the, of the data, um, um, the veracity of this data, because these data are also different. Data could be structured or unstructured. Data would be just text data or multimedia. Data could be small or could be big. So 
uh, everything about the capturage, the storage, analysis, data curation, transformation, uh, sharing, uh, um, visualization, uh, querying of data, everything I mean was built just after the, the cloud computing. So the cloud computing today is becoming, I mean, really the, the standard, the baseline uh, to have this kind of, uh, of technologies. Um, okay, I mean, and let me conclude this part and then I move to, to the next module. Um, just mention, I mean, what uh, uh, artificial intelligence is also today. Because, I mean, artificial intelligence, uh, um, of course, is here since uh, more than 50 years. But today, artificial intelligence, as I said at the beginning, just to close the discussion, moved to the cloud. OpenAI was quite smart to move large language models to the cloud, making them ubiquitous, available from anywhere, any place, with any device, I can access my um, chat GPT uh, profile with my computer, with my, uh, with my smartphone, and tomorrow we can do it by voice with our smartwatch. I mean, it's not something that it's so, uh, it's so far away. So cloud computing is becoming today also the uh, baseline technology to disseminate artificial so that's why, I mean, the artificial intelligence community is trying to discuss with the distributed system community in order to both providing AI solution and enabling, I mean, a distributed fashion of, uh, of computation. Um, okay, let me now move to uh, the, other, the other presentation. Do we need Professor Peters to make some break or I can, uh, I can go ahead? I guess the break is uh, in one hour. Okay. I propose uh, that, uh, first of all, I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, of, course, of course, there are questions. There is one in the chat. Uh, excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure. And uh, after uh, we finish the, the, the question, uh, we can have just a two-minute break, no, and no. Uh, then uh, you continue, Lorenzo. But please okay. try to stick to the uh, to the schedule, okay? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was just wondering, in the schedule, there's like um, an introduction to Docker and Kubernetes. So I was wondering when, when are we going to hear about, you know, those uh, i mean just now i will uh, start with microservices which is important for containers okay uh, all right then i will discuss about containers and uh, and no i because I, uh, I well i had a few questions about i had a few questions about dockers about, about docker so um you know sorry uh, you're going to hear about this soon and then you have your questions okay yeah, yeah. okay that's that's, that's perfect uh, that's perfect I'll, I'll i'll um i'll deactivate my audio Okay. Any other question? Please voice up your questions. To, don't uh, write them on chat. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. yeah I have just a small question uh, about about uh, the accelerator in the edge. Do you think that we can we can have uh, some GPUs or other type of accelerator in uh, in edge nodes? I mean, it's already available. Nvidia. Um, NVIDIA is providing, uh, of course, GPUs that cannot be the GPUs that we have in the data centers, but um, uh, there are small GPUs in devices like the Jetson series, the Jetson Nano or the, uh, the Jetson Oil. Um, uh, that means, I mean, it's possible to have an hardware acceleration in terms of training, for instance, but I mean, in terms of uh, everything could be done like um, uh, matrix computation, matrix calculation. And this kind of devices, I mean, helps to have uh, uh, an hardware acceleration. Of course, the Raspberry device uh, doesn't do it, but if you think about the Raspberry device, uh, was born for something different. It's like any uh, a really IoT device, a teeny one, that today is trying to, uh, to, to run quickly, let's say, to try to, um, to meet the artificial intelligence community, but it's another kind of device. 
Um, if you want to see for something that uh, has, uh, let's say, hardware acceleration, looks for NVIDIA um, and the Jetson devices. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Lorenzo, uh, I have a question. Is there really any uh, difference between agent fog computing? Well, it's it's a it's a discussion that there is also in the community because at the beginning, uh, um, after the cloud, the idea was to create the fog, so uh, to have something that anyway was mostly uh, related to to the networking. So fog today in the uh, I mean. Uh, cloud fog edge scenario, it's something most related to the network. Um, also the computation is a network computation. So what is necessary to allow uh, devices to be inside the network, to have an overlay network, some software defined network, but not just for processing data, for example. If they are data, they are data still for uh, network. So uh, fog is something that in the community uh, it's often seen like a, a network-like uh, uh, layer. While edge computing is instead like really a small replication of a cloud, but in uh, and next to next to the user. <clears throat> That's why I mean fog is something that uh, today we don't see much more. Um, the trend is to have uh, um, the cloud edge IoT. That's why cloud computing often is uh, a synonym. I mean, cloud uh, um, computing continuum is a synonym of cloud edge IoT. Because I mean, day by day, even the IoT devices, and I mean the microcontrollers, uh, they are becoming also quite powerful. Now we can do also some inference with microcontrollers. And I mean, there are also uh, in applications where some small neural network is trained inside microcontrollers. They cannot really be devices that probably we will use in production in the, in the near future. But the, the trend is to, um, um, to talk about more about IoT, so cloud edge IoT, than cloud Um, Lorenzo, I propose we have just then maybe one minute break and then uh, you continue because we are already behind schedule, okay? Okay.